argued that every time somebody decides to have a baby, they're engaging in a game of genetic Russian roulette. Now, we all start our lives like this, a single cell, the fertilized egg. At this stage, the odds are overwhelmingly stacked against us. Between 60 and 70% of these eggs never develop to a stage where they can form a healthy baby. So in this sense, we're all survivors. Well done. <laughs> now, whether this egg goes on to form a healthy baby depends largely on the DNA it inherits from its parents. And it's got three different sets of DNA. It's got two nuclear genomes packaged into chromosomes and contained in large structures known as pronuclei, which you see here. Now, the female pronucleus contains the nuclear DNA we inherit from our mothers and is transmitted by the egg. The male pronucleus contains the nuclear DNA we inherit from our fathers that's transmitted by the sperm. And when this fertilized egg begins to divide to form a two-cell embryo, these two genomes join forces to confer on each of us our unique genetic identities. So what about the third genome? The third genome in the fertilized egg is known as the mitochondrial genome. This we inherit only from our mothers. The mitochondrial DNA is contained in the mitochondria which are scattered throughout the egg. It consists of a tiny circular molecule of which human eggs contain about 300,000 copies. Now the sperm also contains mi some mitochondrial DNA, but this is destroyed during early development. So the main job of the mitochondria is to produce the energy our cells need to sustain life. And the genes encoded by the mitochondrial DNA are essential for this purpose. Mutations, harmful mutations in these genes cause a broad spectrum of debilitating and fatal conditions, collectively known as mitochondrial DNA disease, devastating diseases for which we currently have no cures. So for children who inherit mitochondrial DNA mutations, disease symptoms may not become evident until weeks, months, or even decades after birth. And sadly, mitochondrial DNA disease frequently goes undetected, until the affected child or adult develops muscle weakness, brain seizures, or heart failure. In the worst cases, children die before reaching the age of five. Now, women who carry mitochondrial DNA mutations are generally fertile. Yet for them, the decision to have a baby is truly like engaging in genetic Russian roulette. The baby may be perfectly healthy, or it may be seriously affected. There is no way of knowing. The risk of transmission is unpredictable, and this makes for profoundly difficult reproductive decisions. And what makes it doubly tragic is that in many cases, women unknowingly pass these diseases to their children. The first they learn of, of their own mutation is after their child is diagnosed. So naturally, the question arises, isn't there anything can be done to help these affected families? Isn't there some way we can detect the problem early, or better still, fix it before the baby is born? And the answer is yes. Our work is making it possible to replace defective mitochondria with healthy mitochondria, so that children born to affected women do not develop disease. We are intervening not just before babies are born, but before they're even conceived, so that affected families no longer have to make these near impossible decisions about whether or not to have their own children. Now, it's been a long road to get to this point, and as you might imagine, we've had many scientific challenges along the way, but we've also, of course, there were ethical considerations, and we've also encountered legal hurdles. And in order to give you a feel for the magnitude of the task, it's important that we understand some of the basics of mitochondrial biology and human reproduction. So you might ask, how do the mitochondria come to have their own DNA in the first place? Well, our mitochondria descend from ancient free-living bacteria who about two billion years ago were engulfed by precursors of our modern-day cells. And this has been referred to as the most important meal in history because it turned out that the mitochondria could use oxygen to generate, food, generate energy from the food we eat and to store it in the form of ATP. ATP is an energy-carrying molecule which provides the fuel for life in all living things. So during evolution, the mitochondria have outsourced many of their genes to the nuclear genome. But for reasons that we don't fully understand, they have retained a tiny remnant of that tiny circular molecule we saw earlier. It consists of just 37 genes and encoding only 13 proteins. Now, the mitochondrial DNA may be small, but it is very important. These 13 proteins are essential for energy production 
and mutations that affect their function limit the amount of energy available to the cell. And this is particularly problematic for organs such as the brain and the heart, which consume enormous amounts of energy. But it's not while the brain and the heart are often the first to be affected. Mitochondrial DNA disease is notoriously diverse in its manifestations. In essence, any organ can be affected in a, at any age. And disease-causing mutations in the mitochondrial DNA are surprisingly common in the human population. They have been detected in one in every 200 babies born. Now, fortunately, they're present mostly at very low levels. But for about one in every 5,000 babies, the mutation load is high enough to cause disease symptoms. So this brings me to a complicating factor in the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA mutations or, or mitochondrial DNA disease. Mutated mitochondria coexists with normal mitochondrial DNA. And it is the relative levels of these two that determine the severity of disease symptoms. And here's the problem. Women who carry a mix of normal and mutated mitochondrial DNA produce eggs with widely varying mutation loads. This is what makes it so difficult to predict the risk of disease in their children. This is what makes it a, a game of genetic Russian roulette. So working as I do in the field of clinical embryology, I've had the great privilege of spending much of my working life observing the very earliest stages of human development. And during the first few days of life, the embryo undergoes successive rounds of cell division. And then at about five days after fertilization, it forms this beautiful structure known as a blastocyst, and at this stage, it's ready to implant on the wall of the uterus and hopefully give rise to a viable pregnancy. So one option currently available to women who carry mitochondrial DNA mutations is to take cells from these very early embryos and to test them so that we can identify embryos with the lowest mutation load. This provides a way of reducing the risk of severe disease symptoms in a child. However, it doesn't work for women who consistently produce eggs with high mutation loads. In other words, current treatments are not suitable for those at highest risk of transmitting serious disease to their children. So what can be done to help these women to have, have healthy babies? Now, in theory, the problem could be solved by scooping up all of these de defective mitochondria, but there are so many of them, and they're scattered around the egg, throughout the egg, that this would be technically impossible. So, an alternative strategy is to rescue the nuclear genome from its defective mitochondrial environment. And by this, I mean to transplant the nuclear genome from the egg of an affected woman to the egg of a, of a donor who does not carry the mutation. Nice idea, but its execution is far from trivial. For a start, the human egg is no more than the diameter of a human hair. And to transplant its nuclear genome would require microsurgical techniques, which would need to be performed under sterile conditions while keeping the egg happy. Now, before we could even attempt to do this, we had to, to obtain a license from the UK regulator, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And believe me, that was not an easy process. It took the regulator more than a year to satisfy itself that the experiments we proposed to do were permitted under UK legislation as it was at that time. And we were awarded our first research license in 2005. Once we got the go-ahead, our starting point was to do proof-of-concept experiments using abnormally fertilized eggs. Now, abnormally fertilized eggs are generated during routine IVF treatment, and they generally arise as a result of the egg being fertilized by more than one sperm. And they're not suitable for use in treatment, and couples willingly donate them for research. So using these abnormally fertilized eggs, we were able to demonstrate that it was technically feasible to transplant the pronuclei between human eggs. So having done that, the next step was to, to see whether this pronuclear transfer could provide a, a reliable and effective treatment to prevent mitochondrial DNA disease. And for this, we needed a supply of normally fertilized eggs. And we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the women who so generously donated their eggs for this project. Without them, we could have made no progress. And it must be said that that progress was indeed slow. The first major set setback came when we realized that the techniques we had so painstakingly developed during the proof of concept phase simply did not, did not work very well for, for normally fertilized eggs. 40% of them did not survive the procedure, and this was really problematic because we knew that with such heavy losses, the pronuclear transfer could never make an effective clinical treatment. 
So we had to go right back to the drawing board and we tried a number of things and finally solved the problem by radically changing the timing. So instead of waiting until the next day after fertilization, we transplanted the pronuclei as soon as they became visible. And this allowed more time for the egg to recover from the microsurgery before having to embark on the complex choreography required to divide to the two cell stage. I mean, the change of timing seems perfectly obvious now, but it wasn't so obvious at the time, and, and perhaps this was because it meant performing microsurgery late into the night and often into the early hours of the morning. But fortunately, the strategy paid off. More than 90% of eggs survive, survive this modified procedure. And here you can see it here in this video. You can see this, this egg has been fertilized about eight hours beforehand, and the pronuclei are being removed one at a time from here. And then they would be placed back under the outer shell of another egg from which the pronuclei have just been removed. And these will fuse very quickly to form a reconstructed embryo, which in the context of clinical treatment would contain the nuclear DNA from the affected woman and her partner, but the mitochondrial DNA from an unaffected donor. Now, we had numerous other challenges to overcome before we became confident that this pronuclear transfer technique could provide a safe and effective treatment to prevent a transmission of mitochondrial DNA disease. Meanwhile, back in the outside world, our work was subject to unprecedented level of, of public interest. There were public consultations, there were legal debates and ethical debates, and intense media interest in what had by then become known as three-parent babies or three-parent IVF. This term is, of course, very misleading because while the, mitochondrial, the woman who donates her mitochondrial DNA gives the great gift of health, her mitochondrial DNA does not encode any of the characteristics we would consider to confer on us our unique genetic identity. And moreover, in the UK at least, uh, according to UK law, this donor has no, no legal responsibility for the child. Notwithstanding this dubious lexicon, the UK Parliament voted to change the law to permit the use of pronuclear transfer in clinical treatments to prevent transmission of serious mitochondrial disease. That happened in February 2015, and then earlier this year, in March 2017, we were, awarded, we were granted our, our first treatment license, exactly 12 years after we were granted our first research license. Um, so what do these treatments mean for affected families? Obviously, for women of childbearing age, it gives them the possibility to have a genetically related child with a greatly reduced risk of transmitting disease. But it goes beyond that, and a very poignant moment for me was meeting a woman of about my own age, who was at that, that time succumbing to the effects of her own mitochondrial DNA mutation, a mutation she did not even realize she had until her brother became seriously ill and which she had unknowingly passed to her children. She told me how deeply consoling she found it that her daughter's lives would not be blighted by the fear of transmitting to their children the dreadful disease that had eventually claimed her brother's life. So in the broader context, this is our goal. Our goal is to break the cycle of transmission so that future generations of women from affected families do not have to engage in this dreadful genetic gamble. And in this context, the women who donate their eggs for this research and for these treatments are giving the gift of health not just to one child, but to generations of children, children to come. We have some work to go to do to make these treatments as effective as we, can, as we can make them, but we believe it's within our reach to eradicate these diseases from affected families. Thank you. <laughs>